Um, I'm going to try to convey a few messages. Um, I'm from a completely different background. I'm a physician, so um, I'm going to talk to you about what I know, uh, which is medicine. Um, the, the message I want to convey is that it is possible, not sure obviously, that the situation in the cancer field may move very quickly. Do I have something to? No, uh, yep. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. The first part, which is um, probably crucial, it, these are data we obtain at Polytechnic with Mirisuma and Jean-Marc Steyert, which is which are pooled data on cancer mortality from uh, 19 Western countries. Uh, in the Western world. So these are the US, France, Germany, countries like that. And when you look at um, the data, you see, am I on the right? Okay. I'm s do I show something? Okay, it's not the right one. I'm sorry. Um, okay. N okay, never the. This is the pointer, I'm sorry. No, 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 I want, okay. Okay, the pointer doesn't point. So, um, okay, or oh, it points the wrong direction. Okay, these are age standardized ratio uh, mortality. These are data from the death certificate for most Western country. And you see that there's not been a major drop in cancer mortality since the early 60s in most Western world uh, countries. Um, you see a slight drop in older age since uh, 1995, but it's not major. So what you see appears to look like a financial bubble. You have not had, despite zillions of dollars spent on research and treatment, a major drop in cancer mortality. So I hope I will not mix. Okay, these are data pulled from 19 countries. These are worldwide, uh, country-wide data. You see that, for instance, in lung cancer, you had an increase since the early 60s to now in lung cancer death rate, and obviously a decrease, which has a lot to do with um, tobacco smoking bans. You see a decrease in the number of deaths from stomach cancer, which dates back prior to chemotherapy. But when you look at these two very interesting data, this is breast cancer. You see that the likelihood of dying of breast cancer today in a given age bracket is quite similar to what it was in the 60s. The same with prostate cancer, when basically there has been no difference in the number of cancer deaths per age bracket, per age, and everything else. That means that we cannot see on these countrywide data the impact of mass screening for prostate cancer. I mean, no impact of PSA, for instance, for uh, screening for prostate cancer, no impact of mammograms, no impacts of modern uh, high-tech uh, drugs. Uh, I cannot put all the data, but in the meantime, you can see a marked increase uh, in the deaths, always per age bracket, for melanoma, brain tumors, and everything else. So what you see is in deep contrast with the common knowledge of the uh, victory uh, on the war against cancer. Okay, so if you go back, uh, one point I wanted to make, the, uh, which I think is important. This lack of success, uh, this absence of success also coincide with the lack of success in other major disease like Alzheimer's disease and with the distance that all the authorities have made between the researcher 
the physician and the patient. Now we see files, we see curves, we don't see patients. And we don't see the difficulty of the dying patient and all that sort of things. So we are not intended to change the system the same way that our predecessors were. Uh, cancer, there are two different views, radically different views on cancer. One, it's a complex disease. You're dealing with tens of thousands of different genes. You're dealing with complex interaction. Or you're dealing with a simple disease. And to a physician who I am, your cancer is always the same. You can see a cancer when it's on the skin. You can make the diagnosis without having to go to fancy molecular biology or anything like that. You see and you make the diagnosis on cancer on four different figures of things. Increased pressure, fractal shape, increased glucose uptake, and intracellular alkalosis. And I'll go through that. Uh, okay, cancer is hard. When you do a rectal examination to look for prostate cancer, you're looking for uh, hard. It's hard like a nut. Uh, and if you put the visa data we did with Vin Village City of um, Louisville in the US, when you put a needle into the tumor, you see that the liver parenchyma is quite soft, four millimeters of mercury. When you're dealing with cirrhosis, which is hard, by if you know Greek, uh, it's higher. But when you go into the primary tumor, it's even harder. Cancer is always hard. Uh, second point, it has a very peculiar fractal shape. It's always, whatever the primary, it's a mammogram, but could be done same way with the lung cancer. It has always this fractal, stellar type of shape. When you see that, you don't even need to do the biopsy. It's obvious. It's obvious, obviously, to us. It may not be to you, but it's, to us, it's obvious. The third point, cancer always, there's always an increased uptake of glucose. Here, it's somebody with a lymphoma, and you can see that when you um, inject radioactive glucose, there is going to be an uptake in the nodes which have cancer there, and you can see that you have huge cancer mass here, there too. What you, the brain always has glucose uptake. We're functioning with the brain, and there's always some uptake in the urine. But when you see that, it's quite sure you're dealing with the cancer. The fourth point is that cancer is alkaline. So you, you do not go to rounds and things like that. But each time you see a slide, it's colored. It's colored by uh, dye, which are acidic, and go to the tumor because they are alkaline. No, I'm sorry. It's a uh, wrong way. The tumor is alkaline. The dye is acidic. And that's why you, you see it. Uh, so the... The first, the second point, the first one was that we were dealing with the bubble. The second point is that probably cancer biology is simpler than what we think. And when you, when I listen to your talk or discuss with people like yesterday evening, I know nothing about your modeling and all that sort of things, but uh, finance, it's about greed and fear. Uh, biology probably is in that level of simplicity. Cells can do two things. They can either burn or synthesize. They cannot do both at the same time. And a lot of things in biology could be explained by either you burn or you synthesize. One simple example is the difference between the day and the night. During the day, we exercise. The temperature is higher for the one who have kids. The temperature is one degree higher at night. We urinate because we burn. But at night, we sleep, and we, the temperature goes down because we synthesize. And for the men, my age or, or younger, there are erections at night because synthesis is up, hormones are up. So a lot of things could be seen either by, um, biology could be summarized either by uh, burning or by synthesis. The point I'm going to develop is cancer is probably simply the fact that the cell cannot burn. So our um, 
in, uh, currency is not the dollar, it's ATP. ATP is produced by the burning of glucose, and it can do a lot of things. Um, and ATP is built in a small organelle called the mitochondria. So in the cell, you have two different things. You have the cytoplasm, and you have the mitochondria. In the first part of the uh, glucose metabolism, which is the center of the biology, is, takes place in the cytoplasm. There is no oxygen around. And if the mitochondria is off, you will produce things which will make the cell device synthesize. When the mitochondria is on, cell will burn and produce ATP. That's, so the mitochondria is off, you make biomass, the cell will divide. When uh, the mitochondria is on, the cell burns and it make ATP. So in the human body, you have two different types of cells, the differentiated cells, like the one, the neurons or whatever. Uh, the mitochondria is on, so the cell is making ATP. The cell is acidic because uh, it makes also CO2, which is different from uh, the dividing cell, the stem cell, Robert Kirkwood was talking about before. Uh, the mitochondria is off, so it doesn't burn. It makes like a less ATP, less um, acidity because of less CO2, but as it doesn't burn, there is secretion of all the things which are needed for cell division. If you go to the cell cycle, the cell divides, and the cell divides in a way which hasn't changed in the past, let's say, 2,500 million years. It's always you have a very sequential way. The cells first make RNA, then they make DNA, then these phases. And for mathematicians who are around, here you see a lot of things which are in the cell. First is ATP, and you see that you have one curve. When you see other markers, which are NADH or NADD, whatever that is, with the redox cycle for what that interest, people and H plus, you see that these three curves are exactly the same. Meaning that probably the exact replication of the cell cycle is based on an internal mechanism, which probably is uh, the uh, pH regulation of the cell. And all what has been seen are extremely complex, probably is that level of simplicity. I'm not going to go into more detail for that. I don't think it's the place for that. But the point I want to make is that a lot of people who think things are extremely complex, but other people who think that probably it's markedly more simple than we think. And if it's more simple, means that change could occur much quicker than people would expect. Cancer, there's one difference between cancer cells and normal cells. The mitochondria, which is the place where the cells do burn, th they produce ATP, and the mitochondria in cancer is gone. It's partially destroyed or it's completely destroyed. And there are a lot of paper in the literature which demonstrate that when you put back the mitochondria into the cell, which is not something you can do in a patient, unfortunately, the cancer cell stop growing. So in the cancer, the mitochondria is off, so the cell does not burn. So it's ATP deprived, not enough ATP. And the tumor and all the markers are completely different from the cancer cells. The point I want to make, the second point, the first one was the bubble, the second, that since the 1920s, it's known that the mitochondria is not functioning in cancer, that the work of Otto Warber, we got two Nobel Prize for that. Since that period of time, it's known that cancer cells are blocked in one metabolic state. What, in one of the surprises of history, 
that work has not proceeded, even though it's known to be correct. So the next step I'm going to show you is that you can, to a certain extent, restart the mitochondria. And when you restart the mitochondria, cells will not grow with the same speed. I'm going to go quickly through these slides because I don't think it's of major interest to you if there were eight mice or 10 mice in any group. But we did a work with um, Mohamed Abolassani. We did 10,000 mice. <laughs> and with these 10,000 mice, we tried to screen uh, drugs which could be effective in restarting the mitochondria in, uh, in cancer cells. So these are list of drugs, whatever that may be, uh, or may I don't even think it's readable from the back, but these, it's about 100 drugs we tested, and we tried to see if we could decrease cancer growth by restarting the mitochondria. So the idea was one drug would not work because if not by serendipity, it would have been tried. And we did inject tumors in the flank of the mice. It's easy to inject tumor. You, the skin, you, remove, you move the skin and you inject. And then you measure, and usually within three to four weeks, the mice is dead. So, and we did combinations of drugs, one after the other one. And we could see, this is in bladder cancer, you could see that the mice without treatment are all dead within 50 days or so. And when you treat that with one combination of drug, they do not die or they don't die as quickly. This is bladder, this is melanoma. Uh, these are tumors basically what, for which there is no treatment. The, this is lung cancer. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But we were able to slow down a tumor growth with a simple combination of medication. And I'll go into that in uh, two minutes. It's better if you combine with chemotherapy. We did other screening. We got better drugs. But it, all that's been published up to the point where tumor would regress. Um, so the point, that's where we were four years ago. So what do you do when you have that? The two drugs which were constantly effective in whatever the animal model we were dealing with were lipoic acid and hydroxycitrate. These are drugs I'm sure you have never heard of, but you can go and buy them at the pharmacy next door in France or in Germany or even in the US. So, uh, of course, the people close to you know about what you do, and that's Antonello and was a very friend a very close friend of mine. He knew he had metastatic uh, colon cancer and he was going to die. So obviously he started treatment way before any approval uh, for treatment because you can buy these drugs. And he survived uh, five years. Unfortunately, he died. And he died also because um, of poor medical support. But that's another issue here. Uh, you can see the tumor mass here. Uh, it's in red. Uh, you f these are the hips for what the one who don't know that. And this is the tumor a few years later. So basically the tumor did not grow. At the same time, I, I went to Gubbio, a nice place in Italy, and a, a friend of a friend showed me a lady who was, um, was a Jehovah witness with a glioblastoma multiforme, which is basically something which kills you at 99% within a year or two. And she is still around and she has had in between another child. So in the meantime, completely outside the mainstream of academic or Ivy League institution, you have people who have used the same drugs than we do. Uh, this is somebody who did that in New Mexico and published a few papers on a patient with metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer who were treated with the same type of drugs than we were independently of us, and uh, published um, the, some very good results. So he went, he, he was called to the NCI in the US, uh, and they did what everybody does. Uh, they check if the patient were real, existed or not. The patient are real. And then they ask him to find money to, to do real trials. And the guy is completely, um, that's not his job. Um, OK. so. I, I went to see, with the help of 
of people with the, our data we repeated at Harvard. We went to see the national authority to try to set up um, clinical trials. Um, and it's, so we went. And you know, at the third or th meeting, when you understand that things are not going to move, you have to decide what you want to do in life. Um, so in the meantime, I had published a book. So unfortunate patient came, and I decided that um, as a physician, I was in between two things. Either uh, I would do trials in the regular way, wait a couple of years and something like that before doing things, or if I would start uh, to help people I knew were going to die. So I cannot present you at this stage randomized trials like uh, industry would like, or regulators or I would like. I can only tell you of stories. Uh, I decided that as a human being, my duty was to try to help. So I saw patient never ask for a, a penny, and I'm going just to give you stories which strongly suggest that um, cancer could be changed within a very short period of time. Um, the idea being what I told you before. We try to decrease the amount of glucose which gets into the cell, and we try to restart the mitochondria. And if somebody is interested, I'm sure I can go into the technical details of the drugs, the dose, and everything else, but I don't think that's key at this point. Uh, so I took patients sent back home to die. The only inclusion criteria was they were still capable of walking, and the life expectancy was supposed to be short. But you have plenty of them around. And out of the first 11 patients, now we are nearly 35 months later, we still have five of them alive reasonably well. Doesn't mean that they are cured or anything like that, but they are reasonably uh, well. <clears throat> That's all I can say at this stage. I'm just going to show you, uh, that's Florentine. I just saw her two weeks ago. She lives in mont saxonnet which is in the middle of nowhere in Savoie, not too far from here. She had uh, 15 brain metastases from a sarcoma. The husband was told she was going to die. She had radiation therapy. Uh, that's, she was told she was going to die. She, have, she had even had the last rite of the Catholic Church. Uh, that's in early 2013. Uh, she's quite well and cooked us a good fondue uh, with a glass of um, alcohol after that. Uh, this lady, same story told uh, she had about also 15 brain metastases. The husband was told uh, that she was going to die. She's reasonably well a year and a half after she went back home to work. Uh, Marina, she had the liver metastasis. Uh, she had liver primary and lung primary. She survived two years. Uh, she was involved in some sort of a uh, Brittany revolution against the French government, and that's where they took the picture. Uh, the tumor was stabilized for a while. Um, these are patients with pr advanced prostate cancer. You have two different types of prostate cancer. The first, the most common one, is extremely benign. You treat it or you don't treat it, the patient survives. And you have a uh, more aggressive tumor, which do respond for a while for hormones. Um, and after a year or two, the tumor grow back, and then you know the patient is dead within a year. These patients were given the same type of treatment that the one uh, we, um, I, I talked to you about, and both of them are alive close to three years later. Uh, the, the first one is playing golf. Uh, I just had him on the phone this morning. Uh, the, the, the key problem we face is that for a large number of other patients, these are tumor markers. You. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure you have heard of PSA or, or other markers. I, if it goes up, it's bad. If it goes down, it's good. So we see a marked decrease in tumor marker for a while, and then a regrowth that we do not control for a lot of, of these patients. OK, um, so I'm just sorry. That's the beast. Uh, that's
that's something we published in 2005 with Maurice Israel. Um, the cancer is basically uh, increased uptake of glucose because it cannot burn the glucose in the mitochondria. It, when you see this picture of cancer, which obviously is something you cannot decipher from the back, just you have no genes written there. You have no mathematics. It's just a picture of a giant bottleneck, metabolic bottleneck, um, which is probably not much more complex than diabetes is. What we do at this stage is we try to improve what we have using patient-based trials. So I see patients and I tell them what to do. This patient had um, uh, metastatic colon cancer, several lines of chemotherapy. You can see it's black. It's not good when it's black. And I added uh, this combination of drugs I was talking about, plus digoxin, which is a heart disease uh, medication and it cleaned up within a, a month to relapse later, by the way. Um, the last point I want to make, uh, or maybe probably the summary. Uh, a lot of people speak about the complexity. I am not convinced that cancer is a complex disease. Probably cancer is a disease very related to diabetes. Uh, in a few days ago in the French newspapers, but if it was in the French newspapers, probably another type of uh, newspaper also, there was a trial published saying that um, an anti-diabetic is a highly effective treatment uh, against uh, leukemia, something I never heard of. But this field is moving. Uh, the drugs which will help treat cancer are on the market for most of them. And uh, cancer could be not cured, but probably more effectively treated within a very a short period of time. The second point is something we're working on, is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease on the researcher standpoint, has a lot of common uh, stand, um, features with cancer. Same age bracket, when you see somebody 80, you don't know if he has cancer, Alzheimer, or he's healthy. I mean, you don't know who is going to get what. You have the same type of risk factor for Alzheimer than for cancer, and it's inflammation. And in cancer, cancer is hard. It's how you know that you're dealing with a cancer when you can reach it. At the uh, brain of an Alzheimer's disease patient, obviously don't, don't touch, but it's hard also. So there are a lot of common features. And I'm convinced that the way, the day one, the, an effective treatment comes from one disease, an effective treatment will probably um, come to the other one. I've tried to share what I know. What I know is that just probably these diseases are markedly more simpler than, are markedly simpler than we think. Probably clinical trials should be done in institution whose job it is, but probably they cannot do it. So possibly the patients will do that themselves, and within a reasonable time frame, things will be sought out by themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, why was there difficulty with getting funding for clinical trials uh, in France or in the United States? I uh, the United States, it's a great country, but I haven't tried. Um, it's extremely aggressive to speak about simplicity when people speak about complexity. It's extremely aggressive to come back with drugs. I mean, cost of treatment, which is far from perfect that we have, is about 200 euro per month. Um, obviously, there cannot be any support from the pharmaceutical industry for that. And, you know, it's a, it's a different game. Um, I did not succeed. So I, I felt probably it was my fault. You know, we're all not perfect. Uh, but I sent others to try uh, the same failure. Another question? Just a question and a comment, actually. The, the question is if there are any side effects on the treatments, 
And the comment is on the first part of the presentation when the message was that there have not been any dramatic changes or even de deterioration in cancer trends. And I, I, I probably would have been also interesting to see, because I mean, we are denying all the, the, the impact of uh, screening programs. So it would have been interesting to see at a country level per cancer, I mean, how screening program had been uh, having a good, imp a good uh, impact on breast cancer. I'm sorry, I'm going back to the data, I'll skip it that thread. Uh, side effect, not much. Uh, we had a few, um, two cases of seizure, uh, a few cases of weight loss, and one hepatitis, but nothing major. When you go and see the data on prostate cancer, which is here, you see these are number of deaths per age bracket you see absolutely no impact of screening procedures. You see absolutely no impact of modern uh, hormonal therapy. In the 60s, they knew to how to treat these people. They would just cut the testes out, or chidectomy, as they say in French or in English. Now they do it chemically, but they basically haven't changed the death rate, and a lot of the screening for prostate cancer has been abandoned in a lot of countries, and it's going to be abandoned in the other ones. As far as screening mammograms, you have extended debate over whether or not it's useful. When you're 30 or 40 years after the start of an easy procedure, and people still debate if it's worth, on, worth it or not, you, you may make up your own mind, but probably not a major impact. Yes. In, in one of your early slides, you showed that uh, at the highest ages, there had been a decrease in cancer mortality uh, at the, yes, at the highest you're right. ages. Yeah. Um, I, I, would, I would suppose that that is due to changes in the practice of medicine in recent decades, which have seen that now oncologists and surgeons would be prepared to treat older people, whereas previously they would have been excluded from the option of an aggressive treatment for cancer. So I wonder if that's not just an artifact of changing medical practice. I wonder, would you like to comment? I, I, obviously, there's been a, a decrease in the past, uh, let's say, 15 years. These are data, you, you, you find it in every country. Uh, it's quite clear. Um, we don't also know why there was an increase in the 60s there. Um, whether or not it's better treatments, less aggressive treatment, targeted therapies. I'm not, go I'm not saying that targeted therapies are not good. When you look at Gleevec, a treatment of uh, leukemia, you see a drop in the number of deaths uh, from that sort of leukemia that you can find in this data bank. Um, that's all I can say. Other questions? Yeah. Are there other doctors that you work with or that you wish to work with so that your efforts might be multiplied? <laughs> No, no, I mean, it's the, the field is divided in different groups. You have the academic group, which you know, working with its own laws, and you have integrative medicine, you have a lot in the US, you have a lot of people like that in France. Um, I've tried to find the way in between. Uh, a lot of people are interested. What's surprising to me is that at some point, a lot of patients know as much as I do. At the age of internet, at the age of whatever data you can find on the internet. A lot of people who are as knowledgeable as the physician. Um, it's, I mean, what I know to do is to try to simplify hypothesis. How to run what's possibly going to happen, it's beyond what I know to do. 